Hi, before we get started, I just have a couple of super quick announcements. First, our uh, Union Psychotherapy Program and Union Studies Program are still accepting applications through July 1st. Um, and I recently uploaded a few new Robert Moore items to uh, our online store. If you're a fan of Robert Moore, at the store page, you can just scroll down and it'll show new uploads. Um, and there's also a little widget with new uploads on our homepage if you just scroll down. Also, thank you to everyone who supported our first spring fundraising drive. Uh, we managed to meet our uh, goal, um, so we did receive the matching grant, and so I just want to thank everyone who participated in that. Also, if you uh, missed our spring gala, uh, the video is still live on YouTube, and there's a link on the blog, so you just go to uh, the Union Theology blog, and it's currently the first post. Um, I'll also add a link in the show notes. That's it. Okay, thanks. Welcome to the Jungian Anthology podcast from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Archetypes, planets, and glimpses into a new worldview with Richard Tarnas. We were honored to have best-selling author Richard Tarnas on the podcast. In this interview with host Patricia Martin, he offers compelling insights into the archetypal dynamics now unfolding in the world and how these coincide with certain major planetary alignments. Tarnas considers how our evolving understanding of the underlying unity of psyche and cosmos has relevance for the profound transformation humanity is currently undergoing, and he looks several years into the future to discuss the implications of major upcoming transits from a Jungian perspective. This interview is full of rich insights delivered with Tarnas' distinctive form, warmth and vision. Richard Tarnas is the founding director of the Graduate Program in Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, where he currently teaches. Born in 1950 in Geneva, Switzerland of American parents, he grew up in Michigan, where he received a classical Jesuit education. In 1968, he entered Harvard, where he studied Western intellectual and cultural history and depth psychology graduating with an A.B. cum laude in 1972. For 10 years, he lived and worked at Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California, studying with Stanislav Groff, Joseph Campbell, Gregory Bateson, Houston Smith, and James Hillman, later serving as Esalen's Director of Programs and Education. He received his Ph.D. from Saybrook Institute in 1976 with a dissertation on LSD psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, and spiritual transformation. From 1980 to 1990, he wrote The Passion of the Western Mind, a narrative history of Western thought from the ancient Greek to the postmodern, which became the bestseller and continues to be a widely used text in universities throughout the world. In 2006, he published Cosmos and Psyche, Intimations of a New Worldview, which received the Book of the Year Prize from the Scientific and Medical Network in the UK. Formerly president of the International Transpersonal Association, he is on the board of governors of the C.G. Jung Institute in San Francisco. In addition to his teaching at CIIS, he has been a frequent lecturer at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara and gives many public lectures and seminars in the U.S. and abroad. Richard encourages listeners to view a video on YouTube called Richard Tarnas on the Planets in 2021 via the CIS YouTube channel, and there's a link in the show notes. Um, we also have a lecture recording in our online store um, when he came to speak at our Founders Day Symposium in 2018. It's called A Kairos Moment in an Archetypal Cosmos, and there's a link to that in the show notes. So now here's the interview. Hello, this is Patricia Martin, and I'm a cultural analyst, author, and professional affiliate at the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Today, I'm with Richard Tarnas, historian and founding director of the Graduate Program in Philosophy, Cosmology, 
and Consciousness at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He's also the author of two best-selling books, Passion of the Western Mind and Cosmos and Psyche. The latter was named Book of the Year by the Scientific and Medical Network. Richard served for many years on the Board of Governors of the C.G. Jung Institute of San Francisco. He speaks around the world on topics such as creating a sustainable society, synchronicity, and Jungian archetypes and astrology. We're so honored to have you on the show today. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Patricia. Happy to be here. You've studied the work of Carl Jung extensively, and you write a fair bit on the Jungian idea of archetypes. How do archetypes play a role in the drama that is facing the Earth community today? Well, Jung recognized that um, in forming the human psyche at both the individual level, but also the collective level, uh, that informing everything that we experience, that we um, not not only dream and and uh, bring forth in our in our in our artistic uh, creativity and so forth, but our our most essential uh, experience is constantly being shaped by these powerful uh, archetypal um, forces, principles, essences, uh, and when he when he recognized that it was first of all, as a result of going deep in his own, uh, as I don't have to tell your audience, I mean, deep in through his own um, transformational uh, crucible of, of his own um, journey, uh, psychologically, spiritually. And, and he just got to such a deep level that he was able to access um, the this arch- what he called um, either the collective unconscious or the archetypal unconscious. Uh, this vast domain of of psyche that uh, shapes our informs our experience uh, even in in the most uh, individual ways and i remember uh, joseph campbell often came to uh, eslin institute where i where i lived and worked for for a decade and um I used to be program director there and he would come and give seminars every year. And he would, he liked to compare Freud and Jung by saying, well, <clears throat> Freud was fishing, uh, but he was sitting on a whale and, uh, <laughs> and, and it was Jung that basically recognized that there was a whale there, that it was, uh, and, and Jung himself, by the way, actually used that metaphor. Um, when was it? Oh, it was right after, he had finished Answer to Job, his great um, kind of prophetic uh, essay on, uh, in some ways, the one of, one of the most important things he wrote uh, when he was in his mid-70s. And he, uh, and he said, um, in a letter, he said, I have landed the great whale because it was such a powerful, uh, he, he kind of had accessed such a powerful level of, what was shaping human the rev, the evolution of human religious consciousness, and particularly uh, in the West, and in, in uh, as influenced by uh, Christianity and Judaism. So anyway, um, when when Jung gets this uh, insight in, in the early part of his career about the uh, power uh, and even uh, dominance of archetypal forms in in shaping human experience, he was actually recovering a deep insight that went back to the ancients, to uh, to traditional peoples, indigenous societies, uh, and uh, where they recognized that there were uh, gods and goddesses or, or, or powerful spirit beings that were uh, in a sense, the, the, the immortals or the eternals that were shaping the mortal and finite experience of the human being. And they had a kind of awe uh, about this. And it was really the, the Platonists, Plato and, and, and his successors, uh, that kind of transformed the idea of gods and goddesses into the idea that there were these archetypal principles at the, at the very um, uh, top of the ladder of reality. And uh, for example, Plato said, 
all things uh, that are beautiful are beautiful to the precise extent that they are participating in an archetypal form of beauty itself with a capital B, the very principle or eternal essence of the beautiful. Now, an, an ancient prior to Plato would have said to the extent that Aphrodite was present or Venus or, 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 or some other powerful uh, being of, of great, uh, that represented beauty. Well, what, when Jung comes along, He's coming into a world in which the gods and goddesses, as well as the, uh, these kind of platonic uh, transcendent ideas or forms, have been erased from uh, serious intellectual discourse. And yet he finds when he delves deeply into his own psyche, into that of his patients, uh, into uh, dreams and and into uh, works of, of art and religious uh, experience and so forth, he, he, re he rediscovers this, this um, domain. And so uh, when we bring this into the understanding of our current moment in history, uh, it, it's an extremely helpful lens um, by which we can recognize deeper uh, patterns at work. And uh, in a way, I, I could, uh, we, we could talk a little bit, uh, if you'd like, about what I see right now as being, you know, s some of the more uh, potent um, mythic archetypal uh, dramas that are, in, in a sense, uh, shaping our, our historical moment. Yeah, I think it's fascinating to to consider applying the ideas of the archetype and archetypal energy and psyche to the current moment. Please. Well, Jung himself, of course, uh, initiated this uh, within depth psychology. He he initiated this. Um, application of what he learned in his own interior life uh, and in that of his patients, uh, recognizing that the same thing was operative in, in history. In a sense, he, he brought to modern psychology the recognition that every individual life is on a journey, that it's, it's in some sense, each, a life is not just a, a kind of series of years that are in a that are, have a kind of neutral uh homogenized quality they, they there there is an unfolding narrative there's a there's a spiritual and psychological uh story or narrative or drama that's unfolding we're on a journey and um that was one big recognition that it was a spiritually meaningful journey. This is this is rather different than, say, Freudian psychoanalysis, and certainly very different from behaviorism or, or you know, some of the more, um, oh, those kinds of psychology that 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 more or less uh, don't recognize that there is a depth dimension to human experience. So. He, he, he first made that very important uh, uh, recognition. He brought that into our psychological discourse. But he then made an even more kind of, in certain ways, even more uh, dramatic uh, uh, insight available to modern depth psychology. And that's the recognition that our individual psycho-spiritual journeys are each uh, embedded in a collective spiritual and moral and psychological journey. And that that collective journey that we're all on is shaping us in, in certain ways. So when we're born into a, a certain time in a certain culture, uh, we are carrying that the, the historical destiny, as it were, of that era and of that culture, uh, this, this moment into our own uh, experience and what we do and say uh, shapes in turn the collective. So there, it's a kind of recursive loop by which um, the, the, the larger whole is shaping the part of each of our individual lives and our, our individual uh, lives and actions and so forth 
are feeding back into the whole, into the collective, so that the next moment, uh, the next era, the next generation, carries everything that we have done, said, thought, uh, uh, also what we what we didn't do, what we didn't resolve, um, and it carries uh, those um, that kind of evolution into itself. They're they're born with uh, into a world that is not a blank slate, but that is uh, just as we are. Uh, we're um, we're not born into a a world that's a blank slate. Rather, we are we are we are carrying a great uh, long historical and even evolutionary drama going back uh, many millennia and in some sense uh, millions of years when, when, once you recognize that we go all the way down into the origins of life, into the evolution of the earth, into the evolution of the cosmos. So in, in all those ways, um, Jung uh, kind of he brought this depth psychology orientation to understanding our historical moment and and recognizing that we're um, we have a kind of historical and and moral responsibility uh, in um, what what we what our consciousness brings to this moment and how courageous we are or or not courageous in our willingness to look deeply into our depths and to integrate them because what we don't integrate um, becomes a, 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 an unconscious power a force uh, it, we either through denial or suppression or, or uh, compartmentalization or projection onto others and that becomes a kind of shadow that um, can really have destructive consequences. So he called on, on us to do the hard work of interior exploration and integration of things that we might not want to look at in ourselves. And that's true also at the collective level, historically, and our, our nation, for example, uh, here in the United States. I think in certain ways, the last few years have been one of the most important uh, moral crises of our time, of, 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 of our history, um, because more than at any time, certainly since, you know, I'm 70, uh, 71 years old now, and at any time in my life, this has been the, the period that has most um, come into recognition of the fact that our aspirations as a nation, our shining city on the hill that would uh, uh, illuminate the world with, with, the, with the light of our ideals uh, that we're bringing into uh, reality here, that, there, that there's a whole other story going on and that we, uh, that we have a past that is is rooted in great injustices and great suffering by by uh, whether it's um, our the past of our slavery or the uh, present of our our the continuing racism or uh, the um, decimation of of indigenous uh, cultures the Native Americans that were here before uh, Europeans came here and so forth and to come into a recognition of that shadow side of the American experiment, as noble as that experiment has been, uh, to come into recognition of that shadow side is absolutely essential for us to evolve as a, as a nation, as a collective psyche. Um, there, the idea of cultural complexes, for example, is something that uh, a number of Jungians have uh, developed out of Jung's work. Uh, and so our uh, own me, cultural uh, complex. This makes me wonder, uh, Richard, if what you might be referring to um, is also playing out in the cosmos. So, for instance, I believe I read somewhere that uh, the millennial generation w came into the world under the influence of Chiron, the wounded healer. And I find it interesting that there's a great deal of hope and uh, 
also maybe a little projection <laughs> on that generation to sort of mop up. And I wonder if, it, 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 do I have that right well, about the millennial um, generation? Well, there, there's a lot of things that could be said about the millennial generation. And indeed, uh, yeah, there, on, on the one hand, there, there could be a tendency, and I suppose it's, it's out there, to um, think that either to idealize that generation in such a way that it, it, it divests the older generations of their responsibility um, and that the millennials are going to take care of it, or, uh, but there's all sorts of other um, characterizations that, that could be made. I think the, the Chiron um, reference, you know, Jung noticed, of course, that when um, his, his understanding of synchronicity is quite profound, the idea that, we, that any given moment of, in time is, um, has a certain coherence to it so that events that happen in different parts of the world or in, in the inner world of a of the, of the interior psyche uh, of a person and then in the external world around them, that they're not necessarily, that there's not a, a linear causal relationship between events that are happening out there and events happening in here. But the, uh, and yet he would recognize that there was an archetypal parallel, that there was a, um, a coincidence of meaning and um, uh, a, a number of commentators have uh, pointed out that the discovery of new celestial bodies, for example, coincides with uh, a period uh, that is often somehow shaped by the mythic resonances uh, of, the, um, of that celestial body, either as it's been named um, or as it uh, emerges through observation as carrying certain um, uh, a certain archetypal quality. So Jung was very interested in um, astrology, you know, from going back to around 19, 9, 10, 11. He, he was already uh, studying it quite a bit, writing Freud about it and recognizing that the charts of his patients um, seemed to open, give him in, insight, the birth charts, the horoscopes of his patients, seem to give him insights about uh, what were the principal archetypal dynamics that were shaping that person's kind of predispositions psychologically and so forth. Uh, and, he, it, and that actually kept developing through his life until by the later 40s, uh, early 50s, he, he was you he said um he was using the he, he didn't broadcast this i think for very good reasons but he he told people privately that uh, and his family certainly knew, knew this his daughter became an astrologer um that uh he was finding it so useful that he was using the uh birth chart information with uh, each of his each of his patients um so um What's true at the individual level is also seems to be true at the collective level. And he, in his book, Ion, he, he explores this in one way. Um, and the fact that Chiron was uh, uh, discovered in the late 70s uh, is, is, uh, has been seen by, by some as, a, as correlated with a certain, like the, the people born in the aftermath of that might have some of that uh, kind of chironic uh, quality. What uh, I and uh, others who have, like for example, part of the Archetypal Research Collective uh, here in the Bay Area or um, uh, in my graduate school where I've taught uh, for many years, uh, California Institute of Integral Studies, Stan Groff, uh, who's a, a, a depth psychologist, very much influenced by Jung. He's a psychiatrist uh, and founder of transpersonal psychology. And uh, he and I have taught graduate courses for many years in which we explore the uh, extraordinary correlations, uh, much to our uh, surprise, um, between uh, the movements of the planets as registered in the 
in, in the horoscope, the birth chart, and in what's called transits, like where the planets are at any given time, how they, inter, how they line up geometrically with an individual's birth chart seems to coincide with remarkable consistency with the archetypal dynamics of that person's experience at that time. Um, to, to such a great extent that this combination of studying birth charts uh, on their own to get a, a lens into what, what's the overall kind of mm, shape of a person's, uh, the, the archetypal configurations of their, of their deep psyche, and uh, the bringing in of personal transits to get a sense for how they are unfolding at any given time, like what archetypal complexes are being activated at what time, for how long, and so forth. This has turned out to be such a uh, valuable area of research that we, um, Stan, Stan Groff calls uh, archetypal astrology the, the uh, Rosetta Stone of the human psyche. Uh, it just, it, it, and it's, which is something very similar to what Jung would talk about, uh, that astrology in his mind was the sum total of all the ancient wisdom and knowledge about the psyche. Uh, uh, from the ancients and the medieval period. And, and then he said, in our modern era, because the stars have fallen, um, we have uh, the need for psychology, and particularly for adept psychology, because the, we no longer recognize the cosmos itself as carrying archetypal meaning. The modern worldview is one in which there's been a disenchantment of the world. And uh, there's been a, it's just moving matter uh, uh, that is evolving and then randomly bringing forth uh, consciousness in human beings that are, are a kind of isolated entity in a vast, unconscious, purposeless, meaningless universe. And Jung said, given that situation, we had to discover the unconscious because um, it's no longer the deep meanings of life are no longer found in the whole, in, in, the, in the larger um, vessel of nature that we are embedded in and no longer in the cosmos. But what um, his ideas around and insights around synchronicity and then around astrology, where he saw that in a sense that would be like synchronicity on a vast scale, a kind of cosmic scale, he um, he he came to recognize that the psyche isn't really um, limited to the human cranium uh, inside our skulls. Uh, what did Alan Watts call it? Uh, skin encapsulated egos. Um, but, uh, not but not just ego, but even uh, the idea that the psyche, if it, that it's only inside our individual skulls, um, young broke out of that insight, uh, out of that uh, um, limited vision and saw psyche, that we are in psyche rather than psyche being in us. And that um, there is something uh, which the ancients called the anima mundi, the soul of the world, uh, that the human soul, the human psyche, individual and collective, uh, is embedded in. Um, and that we are not an isolated entity in a vast cosmic void, but are in fact um, participants in a larger unfolding soul of the world. Uh, and, and, and then the recognition that the movements of the planets seem to bear a consistent correlation with um, archetypal, the archetypal dynamics of human history uh, has just opened up a whole invaluable domain of research because it gives us a lot of insights into what's going on right now and how that connects to other historical periods that had um, comparable uh, alignments, but we're in a new moment that has evolved and uh, yet those same archetypal energies are, are constellated again. And uh, we, we have a, um, it, it gives us this whole nother, uh, frame of reference uh, and lens, almost like a, an archetypal telescope by which we can see the, the, a bigger picture of what might be unfolding right now. 
Well, this, I'm very curious about this because I like everyone else, you know, you, you wake up and, and you look at the headlines um, from 2021 and it's history being written in very large type. And, you know, the protests in the streets, the, the, the mob action at the U.S. Capitol, it, it kind of points to America having an identity crisis. And, and, and it's, it's sort of a dissent story that makes you wonder, where's the bottom? And, you know, what, how will the, the, the identity emerge? How, how will the psychic structure of, of the nation um, weather this and grow from this? And so I, I just wonder if you could talk more specifically about the larger forces at work here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think you put your finger on uh, exactly. I mean, the United, our nation in particular, as well as uh, the planet, the Earth uh, community, and uh, the uh, the human species, um, all are going through a uh, a very profound um, crisis. And when it comes to the human realm, very definitely an identity crisis. Uh, the uh, so that both the United States uh, as a as a nation, it's kind of gone through a, a kind of death. Uh, it seems to be involved in a kind of um, initiatory rite of passage almost. And I think this is also true of Homo sapiens and, and of our of our larger um, modern civilization, that the our old identity is um, is is going through a dying uh, and um, there's a, a, a powerful impulse for um, a, a kind of moral transformation that will be necessary that has a lot to do with coming into a more mutually uh, respectful, even reverential uh, relationship with the whole that is uh, within our country, um, the different um, peoples, uh, races, genders, uh, um, ethnic uh, lineages, and so forth. That 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 there be a um, a, a movement into a a more um, life enhancing, mutually uh, respectful relationship rather than this kind of top down the the assumption of say a kind of eurocentric white uh superiority uh or patriarchy um uh and you know the the same thing is true for the the civilization as a whole and for the human self image that that assumption that the human being is this kind of isolated top of a of a pyramid uh, that is um, superior to the rest of the of all other animals, all the, all other forms of life, and so forth, and that that gives the human being and like modern civilization the right to just kind of uh, extract and exploit in an objectified way whatever it wants out of the natural environment to serve its own purposes. That's that's going through a kind of uh, a global crisis, whether it's you know the climate, the climate crisis uh, is is in certain ways the most um, pervasive uh, global crisis of all. But then it takes forms of the social and political form, the and the economic uh, and the and and these are all basically uh, moral crises. And I'm convinced that. Uh, as we look around at the various features of our moment, it's hard to uh, avoid the conclusion that all the uh, typical characteristics of, of an ancient um, ritual of, of uh, initiation, a, a rite of passage, where there is an, a dying of an old identity and the birth of a new one, uh, where, which, as we know from the work of Jung, of, of uh, 
Eliada, uh, uh, who was for many years in, in your city there in Chicago, at the University of Chicago, uh, or uh, the work of um, uh, all those who have studied um, initiatory rites of passage. Uh, they, uh, Joseph Campbell, for example, um, we, we know that the main features are that there is a kind of, in a, there is a confrontation with a great uh, danger. There is a, a considerable uncertainty about the future. There is a sense of, of facing um, uh, dark forces. Uh, there is a sense that uh, the peril is so great that, uh, that um, it's a mortal danger. Uh, there's often a sense that the rea one's reality structure is somehow collapsing and that one doesn't know what's real. Uh, there is a, um, often a, a quality of physical um, suffering. And all these are taking place in the initiatory ritual as part of a, of a kind of mm, unfolding that is shaping the birth of a, uh, the emergence of, of the shaman, or it is, it is transforming the, the, the child or the adolescent into the mature adult. Um, our modern civilization has not um, held, uh, m maintained sacred rites of passage. Uh, and as a result, we, we don't do what ancient and indigenous cultures have done for centuries, which is uh, create a, uh, a ritual context whereby people can um, go through a dying of their old limited identity and connect to the deep archetypal forces of life and death that deep within themselves, but deep within uh, the net, within nature and within the cosmos. And as a result of connecting uh, with that, uh, with that depth, um, they c can emerge um, with a new sense of who they are that allows them to re-engage the, the adventure of life but no longer from the point of view of being the kind of uh, isolated um, individual who thinks they're very special because of their isolation, but rather uh, they recognize that they are um, flowerings or in, uh, individuated expressions of the cosmos itself and, as, and of the earth itself and of the ongoing ancestral lineage that is that is flowing through them and as a result they're able to um, come into life with a greater sensitivity uh, to the needs of the whole and including seven generations hence rather than just looking at the immediate well-being of uh, like the the quarterly corporate uh, uh, profit report and instead thinking about how are my actions, how is my company's actions, how are my nation's actions going to affect the whole for, for generations into the future? And so my, I'm convinced that we're going through a kind of um, collective pressure cooker of a, uh, of, of, a, of a death rebirth process. And we know that there are very few things that can reconfigure moral values than... Uh, a near-death experience. And in some sense, I think on January 6th uh, of this year, 2021, our, our nation went through a kind of near-death experience as we watched the, uh, the, the Capitol be uh, overcome by the, the mob and um, the, the violence, the rage, the ugliness of it, uh, uh, and um, a profound you know, suddenly realizing how fragile and volatile our, our, uh, our democracy um, is after all this time of thinking it was more stable. And well, I, go it ahead, makes me wonder, Pat, Patricia. Richard, you know, you, you're, you're also a classic scholar and you, you study mythology 
And I, I want, wonder how we will reemerge from this and if that is playing out in the cosmos. In other words, are, are we an adolescent who's, you know, 13 going on 14? Or are we 19 going on 20? <laughs> like, in other words, it seems to me for the collective to face these challenges and re-emerge, right, from the depths is going to take a leap of consciousness. What do indeed. you think about that? In, in, indeed, and I, th and I think uh, that leap of consciousness uh, is something that is, comes, I think, as, as, a, um, as the outcome of both our playing our part um, through courage, through um, uh, stamina, resilience, uh, uh, the willing through our how deep and broad our uh, imaginative uh, capacities and our empathic capacities uh, can can reach. Uh, and I think at the same time, to some extent, there's always an element of grace, you know, of, of, of we're, there's more forces at work than are visible to us or that certainly than we can control. And um, there can be shifts in the wind. There can be uh, the grace of sudden uh, insights, revelations, illuminations that uh, can uh, transform how a person or how a, 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 a society um, acts and, and uh, envisions its, its condition. So, um, well, we have a no number of lenses through which we could look at this crisis. And, and one is the, is the archetypal astrological perspective, which we've referred to here a little bit. And, and in that perspective, you know, we're going through uh, a combination of, of extraordinarily uh, powerful, it's a, it's a rare um, convergence of powerful outer planet um, transits that are just classic for, on the one hand, uh, periods of extremely powerful uh, f uh, forces unleashed, in, in the deep psyche that can move both towards unleashing like a kind of shadow uh, form id, but also of great emancipatory drive and um, progressive uh, impulse for uh, a, uh, a, a, a deep transformation of, of our values. And in fact, uh, I mean, f for those who are, who are listening, who um, are, you know, I've, I've given lectures recently that have uh, addressed this aspect of what we're talking about in a more you know focused way. Um, uh, just last month, I did one for uh, California Institute of Integral Studies as a as a public program, uh, as a kind of archetypal state of the world report. So I do more uh, justice to this there that uh, perhaps any any listeners who are interested can just access. Um, that I think the I think it's called um, this particular one was called Richard Tarnas on the planets in 2021, um, and right when the COVID uh, when the pandemic uh, crisis, which of course is another form of the uh, I think a kind of initiatory mm, facing of mortality and. Uh, uh, limitations and constraints and and uh, suffering, loss uh, and need to rise to the occasion of a, of a great historical challenge. Uh, that when that kicked in uh, a year ago, um, I did a, another uh, one uh, of those kind of archetypal state of the world reports, uh, and that one's called "What's Happening uh, in the Stars Right Now." <laughs> I, I titled it that because so many people were asking either me or just asking, period, what's happening in the stars right yeah, now? What's yeah. going on, Richard, yeah, please. Yeah. But you know what? We just to just to let people know, we will make sure that we post links to those. 
uh, on the C.G. Young Institute of Chicago's website, along with this podcast, so they can access both of those. Right. That's great. So uh, what I would just say by way of, um, uh, of a kind of very brief summary, and keep in mind when we're talking about planetary movements and the cycles, you know, and how they move into the outer planets, move into conjunctions or oppositions with respect to the Earth, we're not talking about the planets causing things happening here in, in a kind of as if it's like uh, electromagnetic radiation that's coming from them and, and, and forcing us like puppets to, be, to uh, act or be or experience in a certain way. It's not like that. It seems to be more of a synchronistic coherence of, of meaning and pattern through uh, the, the, the entire universe, macrocosm and microcosm of of the human individual and the and the and the human species and so um uh, it this is much more like uh as as plotinus said everything's interconnected uh and the movements of the stars are uh and and all things are 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 constantly kind of giving indications of a, of the deeper patterns and meanings of life and that's because everything as he put it everything breathes together. It's a beautiful uh, understanding. It's very holistic and I think completely right on. It's holistic inner and outer as well as um, all the different parts of the visible universe. So if I were to summarize in a single sentence what I, you know, what I see as the um, kind of a, 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 a deeper, Coher um, coherent meaning uh, underlying the, the convergence of the several outer planets that are in um, major alignment right now, I would say that this is a time uh, in which there is volcanic evolutionary pressures pushing for, impelling a uh, a radical reconfiguration of structures uh, in the most fundamental way uh, of all life structures. I, I think that's pretty much the most uh, concise summary that I could give of the of the overall kind of mm, convergence of, of alignments that are that are now um, Sorry, uh, can you can you still hear me right now? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I had to shift my microphone. Um, I think that that that's the the best uh, concise overall summary of the uh, of a kind of larger meaning of the of this rare and powerful convergence of of the uh, outer planets right now, and what a, a the, this kind of underlying significance that I see as shaping our the human drama at this point in time. So as I think about this, I, and I'm reflecting on some of what we talked about earlier, you were talking about the interplay between the individual psyche and the collective psyche. And it, so it makes me wonder, you know, that's a great big picture that you gave us. On a personal level, you know, we're, we're, we're just kind of climbing out of a pandemic. We're uh, undergoing a, a very serious crisis in the world ecology and climate change. And the digital culture is now descending and infiltrating sort of how we come to understand ourselves. So with all of this, this is, this is big and heavy. And how does an individual person, what can we do um, to kind of guide our lives in this moment? Yes, uh, I think you put your finger on the, on the fact that um, all the various crises of our time are kind of, they're like nested in each other in larger, like so that the, the kind of global ecological crisis is, is, is this ongoing enormous um, epic making evolutionary change. In some sense, uh, it's modern civilization is, is managing to uh, 
crashed the the Cenozoic uh, era. I mean, it's just a huge, you know, something on a 66 million year uh, scale. Uh, and then, so something like the pandemic um, or the, uh, it, where, where there's an, another kind of um, global crisis that is particularly affecting the human species. And uh, it, that as, as tremendously grave uh, as it is, I think in some sense, it's a kind of wake up call for this larger, uh, uh, longer term um, uh, unfolding uh, crisis for human beings to basically, among other things, to, uh, to, to come into a different relationship with the whole, um, with you know, uh, what we are part of, uh, rather than um, to be so separative from. Now, in terms of what individuals can do, I think your listeners um, and the, the members, for example, of the uh, Young Institute of, of Chicago and that community, which I very much uh, appreciated visiting a, a few years ago for, um, a, I think it was a, like a Founders Day um, presentation that we had. And um, you're in a very good position there for, for several reasons. One, of course, is that you have um, all the insights and wisdom and, and which is, keeps in, evolving within the Jungian community, uh, the Jungian tradition that, that you're, you're carrying forth, that you're developing. And so there's, there's a lot of uh, the, the need to, for self-understanding, for self-discernment, for um, paying attention to one's own deep psyche, to one's unconscious, to, to, to one's dreams, to uh, ex exploring through forms of uh, experiential psychotherapy or sacred medicine journeys or uh, uh, Jungian analysis and so forth. These are all ways of doing that individual private work that is so crucial for our being able to play a role in the larger um, transformational uh, drama of our time. So that's, that's one thing uh, that is incumbent upon all of us is to do our inner work, you know. But the other thing um, that's so important is that we can't do that work on our own. Um, and uh, we, have, we have a We have a need to be in communities that carry a vision of a higher good that transcends and is often contrary to or very different from that which is um, carried by the larger culture. So I, I think of communities like that as being heroic communities because they have this kind of her heroic uh, allegiance to or fidelity to a, um, a higher good, uh, a, a vision of the good that is, um, that is distinct from the conventional worldview. And we can't do that on our own as individuals. It takes, a, it takes communities of people to support that kind of collective act of the uh, sustained act of the uh, moral and metaphysical imagination to be able to hold a vision um, of the future and of uh, reality, of the cosmos, of the human being that is um, adequate to the demands of our time. And the, the beauty of, 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 a, of, a, of, a, of a true heroic community is that the, a community uh, allows individuals to go through the deep inner work, which can be very painful at times, and that can require the support of others, emotional support. If you're doing that in a community that basically kind of understands the value of a descent like that, a, an in, inward descent and transformation. I mean, Jung basically um, went through his deep uh, descent, you know, starting in 1913 in particular. And of course, the Red Book is the, is the uh, visible expression of that all of Jungian psychology is in some sense the, 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 the visible expression of that descent. But he didn't do that on his own. He had support. He had support from um, 
his wife Emma, uh, from Tony Wolf, uh, from the the group that he kind of helped kind of collect around him, the psychology club, uh, uh, psychological club there in Zurich, uh, and and um, and now we have so many um, kind of heroic communities out there that are that are carrying this, whether it's the Jungian associations and institutes around the world, uh, or I'm amazed by how many there are. I've spoken at, you know, just scores of them. Um, it, it, you know, there'll be several in a state, you know, like Ohio or, or North Carolina, uh, California, um, Oregon, Colorado. It's, it's quite extraordinary. Uh, but, you know, the, the Waldorf school communities, the, 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 uh, the uh, many astrological associations, the uh, Bioneers, the Schumacher College, uh, Esalen Institute, CIS where I teach, Pacifica Graduate um, School, um, the, the, the many, I, you know, very kind of committed ecological, uh, you know, social, social uh, ecological, uh, progressive um, uh, associations and NGOs and community that are, that are focused on on a uh, on a deep transformation. I have a lot of hope for the future because of that um, spontaneous emergence in uh, across the world uh, of of so many individuals and communities that are um, each bringing forth their particular way of participating in this great evolutionary shift. Um, the only thing I'd add to that right now, because I, I think we're probably uh, moving t towards the end of our time here, has, has to do with hope, I don't, with that idea of hope. I don't know if there would be uh, time to say something about that. Yeah, I think there is, Richard. I think um, everybody would love to hear from you as you look at the cosmos and you study, you know, the charts from you know, the micro level to the macro level. What are you seeing that could give the average person hope? Oh, I see. So sure, I can, I can, uh, I can bring in, yeah, from the, from the astrological point of view, you know, we're, um, which is, informs a lot of us how we, how we uh, think about the present and the past and um, the looking ahead to the future. See, the future, it's important to recognize that that archetypes are multivalent. They can be enacted in multiple ways uh, that range from um, the most noble to the most ignoble. From you know, every every archetype has its shadow as well as as its light, it, and it has many dimensions upon which uh, any given archetype can can express itself. You know, physical, uh, uh, psychological, spiritual, in, uh, interpersonal, relational. Um, and so forth. So it's, uh, I think of the great uh, archetypal um, forces that come into relationship with each other uh, and as mapped out in the movements of the planets as being like a great kind of, it's like chordal structures within, within music. And it's up to us as to what melodies we sing to those chords. Uh, it's up to us what even genres, you know, whether it's classical or jazz or hip hop. Um, uh, we, but those chordal structures are there. And then we are given um, kind of the, both the responsibility, but also the creative freedom to enact them in um, a multiple, Simplicity of ways, so it's it's to a great extent uh, up to us how this future is shaped. No, but knowing the um, how the planets are moving and so forth, I mean, I see. Okay, in terms of our immediate uh, situation, um, everybody that pays close attention to the the astrological dimension of things has been quite aware for years going into this that this period uh, of um, even even starting from 2018 and 19, but especially 2020 and 2021, we're ex, we're going to be a kind of eye of the needle that that we are going to have to go through. It's it's when the rubber meets the road, the 
the chickens come home to roost, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the screw tightens. I mean, it's a, a, all the typical, stereotypical um, uh, metaphors uh, are along that line are, are useful there. It's, it's a real eye of the needle through which we are having to go. But um, as we move uh, from, you know, I mean, wow, the drama of the planets in like in the last several months, you know, November, December, January, quite extraordinary. If anybody, I, I talk about her a bit in the, in the um, uh, presentation that we referred to earlier that people could access. But as, we, as we're going forward, um, as we move deeper into the 2020s, already starting in 20, uh, already kind of starting now, 2021, and then even more in 2022 and three, and, and then for the rest of the 20s, we're moving into some other kinds of energies, this, uh, the Uranus trying Pluto in, in particular, uh, the potential, uh, the, the United States chart going through its Uranus return, um, uh, where there can be a kind of new birth of freedom, uh, a new birth period, uh, but only th there's also this Pluto return going on, which is very rare in a country. You, you have to you have to exist for 250 years approximately to go through a Pluto return, and we are going through it. I mean, these last few years, it's as if Hades uh, opened up its jaws and the soul of America got kind of swallowed by the by the underworld. And we we were we have been living in a kind of underworld you know, uh, domain that uh, has been a great shock for the Persephone in all of us, and uh, and yet it is the underworld that is where the great uh, deep transformation takes place. And um, as we're moving into this new. Uh, into the 2020s, it's not that the crises of the past just disappear. Things have been set in motion that we have to deal with. Uh, but there is a real potential here for um, the same energies that have been at work are kind of going to be moving into a more confluent, you know, harmonious interaction that could allow um, what we what emerges out of this crisis, this eye of the needle that we're especially uh, embedded in right now, and I think we're somewhat past the halfway point of that at this point. Um, Thank God. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but that we could move into. Um, I I I think uh, I I have a a real hope that we can rise to the occasion, and that in in some sense there's going to be cosmic forces that are will be there to support that. But I do want to say one last thing about hope itself and the role that it can play, because hope is a, um, uh, what did Nietzsche call it? It's the, it's the rainbow that uh, is above the, the, uh, the cascade of life. Um, it's, uh, hope is not just, it's not a kind of just like an optimistic assessment of where we are and what, what uh, looking at the variables, what's going to uh, emerge uh, in a kind of rational assessment. That's not what hope is. Hope is more like a, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's like a spiritual uh, quality or virtue that is cultivated and that actually can play a role, I think, in um, reaching out into the, um, into a future potential um, and bringing that ideal it's like it's like planting a seed into the future that can that can uh, blossom and if by bringing forth this act of hope and this act of faith in the larger good of the cosmos and the unfolding wisdom of something that's much bigger than any of us as individuals, and much bigger even than than uh, the human being collectively, that we're participating in something that's that's very, very deep and 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 large, very great. And if we have that, uh, if we're able to access that sense of of 
faith in the whole, it can give us a sense of uh, hope for the future that actually can play a, a, an active participatory role in bringing forth a, a, a more life-enhancing future. It's, it's not just a kind of um, assessment. It's, 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 it's part of our spiritual contribution that could be made to the unfolding of, of, of our future. That's a beautiful note to end on, Richard. I want to thank you on behalf of the Institute and all our listeners for just a, a wonderful way of, of seeing what's unfolding. And that is that we're all responsible for cultivating hope because it will change the dynamic. And um, I wish you well, <laughs> and I hope to have you back on the show. Uh, let me just end with one last question. Where, what's new for, for Richard Tarnas? New book, new... Well, uh... Well, I, that's a heavy asking. question, I know. It's like asking the graduate student if they've got their thesis done, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, um, as, as one gets, I suppose everybody during this uh, uh, pandemic period has, has m m gone through uh, those kind of important assessments um, of like what's really important in life and what, what, and especially if one is in one's later decades, um, those kinds of uh, thoughts are especially likely to come to the surface. And, and I certainly have um, uh, thought of those kinds of things. I've, I've had several um, books in me. Yeah, I, as, as you can see, I'm not that prolific. I've done two books in, in my um, in the last 30, 40 years. And that's uh, Partly because as a professor, you just uh, you're very busy teaching, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and those are really sweeping books, Richard. Like thank you. They all they, they took a long time. They were, yeah, yeah, so, expansive. But I have been. Um, there's been uh, four or five other books on uh, re that are kind of connected to those two that are you know things that I have been. Um, writing out in my notebooks for, for years, in a sense, they're, they're all written, but I just, I need to take the time to turn them into that final form that I feel right about publishing uh, them. And so uh, I'm moving towards, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been cutting down uh, my teaching so that I'm, I'm just uh, part-time and then I'm, I'm kind of moving towards retirement about 2023 uh, from being the professor uh, and um, so that I can really focus on bringing the rest of my books out while I still have the, God willing, the uh, mental clarity and stamina that is necessary for that kind of uh, intellectual. Yeah. It's uh, rigorous work. It is, it is. So that's, that's, that's one big thing. There's also been a, a documentary series uh, that's, Based on my work that um, several uh, you know several filmmakers have been working on the last uh, six years or so, uh, called Changing of the Gods, and that's uh, moving. That's almost they're almost finished, and I see that's uh, going to be coming out later this year. So while it's not well, it's based on my work. It isn't. I'm I'm not making the film, but uh, it is related, uh, and I'm I. To, it is related to me, and so I guess that would be part of my, my uh, what I'm thinking of in terms of what's coming in the future. So those are the the big things. I think I'd also like to make some, um, like a video series or something like that that would uh, make some of the things that I've been teaching for years uh, with my graduate students to make that more more available to 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 others um, before well, I Well, we hope to have on. you back whenever. Any of those projects that are percolating and underway are ready. Be in touch, and well, we'd love you. to. We'd be honored to have you thank, back. Thank on you, the show. Patricia. Thank you're, you so very much. Thank you. You're you're a great interviewer, as I'm sure others have told you, and uh, it's 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 a pleasure, a very very um, flowing kind of way of exploring these deep topics together. Thank you, thank Richard. You, thank you. Bye bye. Bye now. This 
podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org. Thank you to our 2020 donors who gave at the contributing member level and above. Barbara Anand, Usha and Ashok Beatty, Jackie Cabe Bryan, Eric Cooper and Judith Cooper, Kevin Davis, George J. Didier, Mary Doherty, James Fidelibus, John Koroluski, Marty Manning, Diane Sherwood, Deborah P. Stutzman, Deborah Tobin, Alexander Wayne and Lynn Kopp, Gerald Weiner, Karen West and James Taylor, and Alan Young. If you would like to join our generous community of supporters, just go to youngchicago.org slash give.